Maintenant, nous allons continuer sur la complexité, c'est incohérent, en, en, en accueillant euh, Paul Ashby, qui vient chercheur. Bonjour. Paul Ashby est un chercheur au Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory, un des plus célèbres laboratoires euh, américains de physique et de recherche à l'interface entre physique et chimie. Euh, il cherche sur des nouveaux matériaux, mais il cherche aussi sur des questions liées à l'origine de la vie. Et donc il va nous parler justement de la complexité du vivant avec un autre type d'approche, euh, une complexité du vivant qui justement euh, nous suggère euh, la grande question qu'on a déjà abordée à plusieurs reprises, la question de, de Zellinger, la question de, le, du problème de l'information que nous verrons encore à plusieurs reprises dans ce colloque, donc quelque chose de très important. Et donc c'est un des deux topos un peu techniques, je vous préviens, mais euh, on ne fait pas d'omelette de, sans casser des œufs, on ne va pas comme là aux frontières de la connaissance. Donc euh, on va maintenant lui passer la parole en le remerciant d'avoir fait un très très grand voyage depuis la Californie pour être ici. I might walk around. Okay, good. A bit. Welcome, everyone. Thank you very much for the opportunity here uh, to speak. Uh, thank you for your hospitality. Uh, Jean and the other hosts have been wonderful uh, leading us around uh, and showing us just how wonderful and beautiful it is here. And I really appreciate all the people here that um, have come to learn about how we can find meaning through the science that we do. Um, this morning's session was uh, very exciting as we looked at fundamental physics to see ways in which our, through those fundamental physics, our interpretations have changed drastically away from a materialistic worldview, um, one that is much more amenable uh, to seeing uh, <clears throat> the meaning and purpose in life um, and also the spiritual nature um, that we all have. I'm going to talk a little bit about biological realm right now. Um, and the biological realm has been one that has not had this transformation yet recently in our understanding. Uh, so the things that I'm going to say are maybe a little contentious. Um, but I'm looking forward to presenting them and sharing them with you um, and, and being able to discuss them. So, as we think about the quest for meaning, many of us ask different questions. Here's a couple footballers, and they may ask questions as practical as, how will I get around this guy? Or, How can I steal the ball? They might ask other questions that are related, like, why am I so much quicker than him? Or, why did my legs not recover quickly? Very practical questions to what they're doing right now. But we also ask other questions. For example, athletes might ask things like, what percentage of type 2x myosin heavy chain do I have? That's a very scientific question. Uh, or, what's my VO2 max? This guy's feeling like he's going to get beat. Maybe he's thinking, do I have a mutation in my ATP synthase, which is affecting me? Or we may ask more philosophical questions. Why do I play football? What's the basis of my values? Who am I? Why am I here? Where did I come from? We ask all these kinds of questions in life, and they're all interrelated with each other, from the practical to the highly philosophical. And the goal of my talk today is, is actually kind of modest. Um, it's simply to show that the science of biological information points us away from a worldview that reduces reality simply to energy and matter, <clears throat> and instead a worldview that embraces the interplay of mind with the material universe. So, I'm going to use proteins as a model of what is biological information. And so, what do I mean by protein? Well, first, let's take these footballers. And what are they doing? Well, they're playing, which means their muscles are contracting as they run around and kick the ball. Um, and if we were to 
zoom in on their muscle fibers, muscles right here, and we zoomed in quite a bit. We use a nice strong microscope that increased the magnification by about 10,000 times. We can actually look inside their muscle fibers. And we can see the different parts, uh, like these myosin bundles. <clears throat> and then we'd also have these organelles in the cells. These are called mitochondrions, or mitochondria. A single mitochondria is shown, mitochondrion is shown here. And if we zoom in about 50 times, we can see the inner structure inside this. This organelle is about uh, half a micron in size. What is a micron? Uh, if you take the span of my arm here, it's about one meter. And then you were to divide that by 1,000, you get down to a millimeter. You divide that by 1,000 again, you need a good microscope to be able to see that. That's a micron. This mitochondrion is smaller than that. It's, one mic it's point, uh, 0.5 microns in size. Well, let's keep zooming in, because we have lots of very good microscopes. We can keep looking smaller and smaller and smaller. And so if we zoom in on this portion right here, this part is called the crista. Um, and the mitochondrion has many cristae uh, located throughout. And on this crista, are a bunch of dimers or pairs of these molecular machines that are called ATP synthase, okay? And we're down to the point now where this ATP synthase is about 20 to 30 nanometers in diameter, okay? So a nanometer is one one thousandth of a micron. We're now using our most exquisite microscopes, and this is actually solved by shooting x-rays at the sample and looking at the scattering so that we can get down to the positions of the individual atoms on this, this molecular machine. <clears throat> and what does this molecular machine do? Well, it synthesizes ATP, which is the fuel that is used throughout the cell to do all sorts of chemical reactions. <clears throat> and so, these proteins here, they do the chemical work in, the bio, in, in, the, in biology. And specifically, this one synthesizes ATP. That's its sole function. And this molecular machine is made of many protein subunits. So let's keep zooming in even more. And so an individual protein um, is made up of amino acid building blocks. Okay, so a protein is a linear polymer of amino acid building blocks strung together like beads on a string or like letters in a word. And the sequence of the amino acids in proteins contains information. So that's, that's my first point. Well, let's look a little closer at these proteins. So I want to first talk about these amino acid building blocks. So here's an amino acid. This functional group on this side is called the amine group portion. This over here is the carboxyl group. And this amino acid also has a functional group off of this carbon, and that's what gives it its unique chemistry. And so there's about 20, well, there's 20 of these that occur naturally uh, in, in nature. And you can take these amino acids and do a chemical reaction where this amine bonds with this carbon and expels water, and you get what's called a peptide bond. The energy of this bond doesn't matter at all, or it matters very little, on this side chain chemistry of the amino acids. And so what we can do is we can string these together in any order. And so you can see here, here's one amino acid. This one's called a serine. It has a peptide bond to this one called a histidine that has this functional group. And you just go on and on, and we've actually labeled each one of them with just individual letters to make it easy to represent the amino acids as we put the sequence together. So the number of possible sequences that grow, that, that results from this amino acid chain, it grows exponentially with the number of amino acids in the protein. This number gets very large very, very quickly. <clears throat> and so I'm simply trying to say that um, for information to exist, it requires that there be possible options. And proteins are a great example because there's so many different possible sequences that we can uh, create. 
Well, it's the specific sequences that encode the information to do specific tasks. So for example, in this ATP synthase, it has these different subunits, and if we look at this protein, which is the beta subunit, here is the sequence of the amino acids. Now, you can't read this. Uh, it's actually very hard to read it. But this sequence conveys meaning, just like the letters in a sentence or a paragraph communicates meaning. <clears throat> and as a matter of fact, most possible sequences are excluded to be able to produce proteins that can do specific tasks. Most sequences out there, the vast majority, don't do anything, are not useful. You have to have a very narrow set of sequences to actually do the chemistry of life. And that is the second requirement for information. Information is the excluding of a bunch of possibilities from a space of available possibilities. So I want to give you a rough estimate of the information in this ATP synthase uh, beta subunit. And first I want to say uh, a little bit about the structure and the sequence leads to a very specific shape of the protein. And that shape we call the tertiary structure. Um, but what we found is that there's many proteins that do very similar chemical tasks and that chemistry is done in an active site. But the protein surrounding it is kind of flexible to be able to get the shape that we need to be able to do effective chemistry. And so um, what we've been able to do, and this is actually quite recent, is Google has used large language models and artificial intelligence to be able to take sequences of proteins, take those sequences, correlate it with the structures that we know, and by analyzing all of the data, be able to create a model that allows us to be able to predict these 3D structures. And generally what we find, um, it, and this is very imprecise, um, is that we don't need to have a specific sequence on this outer material. Definitely you need to have a certain sequence, but it's not highly specific. But what we also know is that in the active site, where the chemistry is really happening in this protein, it has to be very specific. And I'm showing here the sequence of four different organisms. Okay, we have the cow, we have a bacterium, E. coli, um, which is a gram-negative uh, bacterium. We have a uh, blue, uh, green algae, and we have a, a, a bacteria, uh, uh, another bacterium here, and these bacteria are actually very far apart from each other uh, in the tree of life. The goal here is to represent some of the most diverse organisms that exist in nature. And what we see when we look at the sequences and line them up from one organism to the next is that they actually align almost perfectly with each other. This means that for this protein to do its job across all of life, you have to have a very specific sequence of amino acids to get that active site. <clears throat> and so if we were to look at that, we'd need, basically need one in 20 possibilities. We need that specific amino acid. And there's about 100 of these in the active site of the beta subunit. And so information is the negative log and base two of the remaining possibilities, or useful possibilities, compared to all the total possibilities. And so I've calculated total possibilities here, and it's about 10 to the minus 335. Whew. That's an incredibly small number. Um, it's, it's incomprehensible how small that number is, really. Um, but I'm just going to put a number on it. This is, this is about 1,000 bits of information. And I call this the biological fine-tuning model problem. We talked earlier, when Luke gave his talk, about how there's fine-tuning in uh, the constants that make up the universe. Uh, he also talked about how you have to have specific initial conditions to be able to get the universe to progress the way that it, it does. Um, both of those are examples of information required to get the universe that we have. This is an example of 
the information that's required to be able to get the life that we have, all life across all kingdoms here. <clears throat> well, I've only been talking about one specific protein subunit so far. Um, but Craig Ventner here, who um, was one of the first to sequence the human genome, um, he was actually able to, to do it much faster uh, than the government program. Uh, so a brilliant entrepreneur. Um, since he sequenced the human genome, he's taken on a project um, to create what's called the minimum synthetic bacterial cell. He's wanting to figure out what are the, the smallest or the fewest proteins that are required to be able to have life. And to be able to have life, you need to do things like have metabolism. Metabolism is the processing of energy that goes on inside the cell. And this protein I've been talking about, ATP synthase, is part of metabolism. Um, you also need to have a cell membrane because the cell needs to ha be separated from its surroundings because the cell is not at equilibrium with its surroundings. If it didn't have a, a cell membrane, then it would quickly go to equilibrium and they'd be dead. So you have to be able to maintain a, a membrane with its structure and function, be able to get food in and out. <clears throat> There's also the genome expression to be able to take the information that's in the genes and make the proteins that are doing the work. Um, there's also preservation of the genome, which means you need to be able to copy it from one generation to the next. So there's all these essential cellular functions, and he's trying to figure out what is the fewest number of genes, or what is the fewest number of proteins to do this? And what he's been able to find is that so far in this work, um, he's down to 473 genes. This work is not done. Uh, he might be able to parse this down a little bit more, but He's already done uh, many decades of work on this project, and he's found over and over again, if I remove this gene, the bacterium dies. If I remove this gene, the bacterium dies. Over and over again, finding that each one of these is essential. He's now to the point where, you know, thinking, well, maybe we can remove whole sections at a time. <clears throat> well, yes, this work is not done. But the striking thing is, he still needs 473 genes, which is encoded by 530,000 base pairs in the genome. So this is the DNA um, that makes up the, the genome. If we were to calculate what is the information content of those 530 base pairs, we'd actually find that it's a much bigger number than just that single protein. Why? Because we actually need the 473 proteins. I've only previously talked about the single protein, uh, the beta subunit of the ATP synthase. So to be able to have life requires a lot of information. So how do we go about getting information? Um, when Darwin wrote The Origin of Species, uh, his goal was to be able to explain if you already have life and you have simple life, how do you go to complex life? And he kind of assumed that it was easy to form the initial life. He talked about it just happening in a primordial soup. And that concept is, has stuck with us for a very long time. We just think, oh, it's going to be easy. We can do it by chance in this primordial soup and bring the parts together to have life. Um, <clears throat> and so let's talk about how we could possibly get this 10 to the minus 335 probability event to happen. What is that number like? Well, it's actually like if you were to go to a beach here, and let's say the beach is 50 meters wide and two kilometers long, and I were to, in the morning, drop a single grain of sand somewhere in there. I can bury it as deep as a whole meter, anywhere within that, okay? I just drop a single grain of sand in there, and then I say, go find that grain of sand. What are the chances of you being able to do that? Well, it's actually 1 in 10 to the 15. So what does it take to be able to get to this 335? You'd actually have to do this over and over again for a whole month. Incredibly improbable. If we were to look at it in terms of the chemistry in the primordial soup, let me give you all the chemical building blocks you need or uh, could possibly have. Uh, 
let's assume that the, there's a concentration of one millimolar, which is a very high concentration for amino acids in, in solution, uh, one millimolar of every amino acid throughout the whole volume of all the Earth's oceans, all the water we have. And you take those amino acids and you form, which is 10 to the 45 amino acids, you'd, you'd form a protein from that and you do that every microsecond. Now, there's no way that you're going to be able to get all these amino acids to come together in a microsecond, but I'm trying to be generous here. Okay, so you do that every microsecond, which means that, um, and given that there's 10 to the 23 microseconds in the age of the Earth, you have 10 to the 68 attempts to make a useful protein given the whole age of the Earth. We're still very, very far away from 10 to the 335. Well, what about if we take all the stars in the universe and say we have a a nice habitable Earth around every single star. Well, that gets us another 10 to the 24. So now we have 10 to the 92. We're still very far away. Uh, do we need to invoke multiverse theory? Well, we need 200, 10 to the 243 multiverses. Um, okay, uh, we've already talked about how that's not really a, uh, a good theory, very um, not testable, but uh, what do we mean we take home from this? Well, we can take home that the idea of these things just coming together by chance is not going to happen given the probability resources we have here on the Earth. Okay. Some people find this argument compelling. Okay. I've got to be careful here, though, because this argument is abused very frequently. Uh, it's also called Hoyle's fallacy. Um, and what it's doing is it's ignoring other possible mechanisms. It's saying that this, pos this chance way of things coming together is the only conceivable mechanism that we can come up with. Okay? That's not good science. Um, we also would call that an appeal to ignorance. We would say, well, we don't know what the other mechanism is, and it can't happen this way, therefore there's something else. We've got to be careful about making those kinds of arguments. Um, and it's also a straw man because we might be avoiding, some people might even avoid other mechanisms that they think are available. <clears throat> so there's problems with pitching the argument this way, but at the same time, I, I want us to be careful about how we dismiss this argument. And the reason why is because um, when we say that there's an appeal to ignorance, what we're saying is, as we do science, we're going to discover the, the next mechanism. We're always holding out for when we make that discovery. <clears throat> How long do we hold out for? How long do we always dream that there will be the naturalistic mechanism? What about if there, it's not true that there's a naturalistic mechanism? Will assuming naturalism lead us to this truth? <clears throat> At some point, we need to work with the information we have, and we can't always hold out for the next naturalistic theory, because that theory might never come. So this gives us a lot of freedom to discuss what's the val validity of this argument versus what are its weaknesses. It's part of our doing our philosophy of science. It's, it's not as simple as just saying, oh, you know, slap a, uh, a dismissive label on it and say, no, that's not good. Okay, well, Darwin, when he was writing The Origin of the Species, he, he said, well, I have, I, I just assume that there's this primordial soup that's gonna give me the first life. And um, it's widely believed that once you have the first life, we can explain the increase in complexity of the origin of variety of species that we have. And it's very common for people to say, well, you know, another mechanism could be something that is Darwinian in nature uh, or in style, but it applies to this, before we have this first organism that we, you know, officially call life, such as something like this minimal cell. And so we can come up with stories about, oh, maybe, this smaller piece of the puzzle comes together and it is useful, so it has some fitness, and we'll keep that. And then we'll keep working on other parts, and when that piece comes together, we'll then we'll keep that. So we can, 
we can imagine Darwinian processes that might get us there. So let's talk about Darwinian processes. Okay, so um, evolutionary algorithms are <clears throat> this Darwinian process, and this phrase, me thinks it's like a weasel, was popularized by Richard Dawkins uh, in his book, Climbing Mount Improbable. And if we were to think about how to be able to get this phrase or this information in the same way that I showed on the previous slide, this random chance, okay? Um, <clears throat> it has 132 bits of information and it would take a very long time, basically just like the, uh, the same problem as beyond the, the probability resources of the universe. But if we do an algorithm where we vary the sequence and then do some selection step and choose the parts that fit a goal, then we can actually go through this very quickly. It's only about 100 iterations to be able to get to our target of me thinks it's like a weasel. <clears throat> so evolutionary algorithms are effective at performing searches for a specific solution. So are evolutionary algorithms this mechanism to be able to naturally create this information? Well, an evolutionary algorithm requires variation. It's easy to get variation in nature. Uh, what about that selection step? How does that work? Well, we call that selection step a fitness function, where we compare what we have against the fitness function to see, is it a little better than what we had before? Are we gonna keep that part or not? <clears throat> and I've shown here um, various searches over an eight-bit search space. So what do I mean by eight bits? We've been talking about the information. This is actually a relatively small search space. Eight bits is accessible by blind search. And I show you what it would look like to do a blind search. You just say, ah, oh, right at my solution right here, I, I win the lottery, okay? Otherwise, no go. <clears throat> There's only eight bits of information in this fitness function. And that eight bits of information allows me to do a search and find the solution uh, in a certain amount of iterations. So here it took about 135 iterations. Well, what about if we do an evolution algorithm with a fitness function that actually has more information? So now for every single parameter or every single uh, option in the space, I have eight bits of information to determine its relative fitness. So this is 64 bits, and here's a very smooth function leading to the, uh, the successful goal, and we find that this search is able to happen much more quickly uh, to find the maximum. We can imagine all sorts of other search spaces too. For example, this one, uh, which has many different maxima, and when we do the algorithm here, we see that it gets stuck at these maxima uh, for long periods of time. This is actually very similar to what we see in nature. Um, which it was labeled by St uh, Stephen Jay Gould as punctuated equilibrium, where you see a large change in, in uh, the morphology of an organism or to another organism, and then it stays like that for a long time. And then you see another large change. Well, yes, these searches can be more successful at finding the solution uh, more successful than doing blind search. But what you need is you need more information in your fitness function to be able to do that search. And as a matter of fact, there's a bunch of other fitness functions that don't lead to successful searches. <clears throat> so doing evolutionary algorithms doesn't actually solve our problem of how we find information because successful evolutionary algorithms require more information than we are seeking. So where does this information come from? It's not from these naturalistic mechanisms. So, what could be a possible solution to how information gets in the world? Well, we've seen that throughout history, human minds have been able to take nature and mold and shape it into specific results, like this cave painting, or this, this ax head, or here's a bronze uh, tool. Or, I really like 
this Pinarello bike. I'd love to have one for myself. We not only shape matter, but we shape ideas too. And so here's a, a picture of an author. This is what minds do. Minds organize and create information. So I think we need to include minds as an active agent in our study of nature and how we get the information in the system that we see around us. So let me summarize. Information is the exclusion of real possibilities. The sequence information in biopolymers, like proteins, is not determined by the monomer identity. And then what this tells us is that biological systems have vast amounts of information, and the information needed even for a piece of a molecular machine is essentially beyond random chance in our universe. If evolutionary algorithms are the mechanism by which this information is shifted around in nature, where it goes from the environment onto the matter of the, the protein, or the RNA or DNA, that actually doesn't provide an explanation for the origin of the information in the first place. The environment that did this selection is contrived. So there's something greater in the universe that is the source of information. Therefore, I think that philosophy and theology need to take their place besides science in our search for truth, meaning, and purpose. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much.